Thanks for listening to the Media People Podcast, the show where we learn about the people who make up the media industry to find out where they started, where they are now, and the stories in between. I'm your host, Victor Genova. For more episodes, go to soundcloud.com slash Podcast. These expressed by participants are personal. If you work in the media world, then you're probably familiar with the line, content is king. And today's guest, Aaron Bronstetter, is someone who works to keep it on the throne. Aaron is producer, talent relations for the hit sports talk show, Off the Record with Michael Landsberg, which goes into its 19th season this fall on TSN. Aaron's role on Off the Record is to navigate the athlete and celebrity world and book guests for the program. He gave us such a great interview that we're going to break it up into two parts. In this episode, Aaron talks to us about growing up in Thornhill, his time at Brock University and Humber College, and his early start in the industry that included roles at Kojiko Community Television, The Fan 590, and The Score. Part 2 will go live Monday, July 27th, where we'll focus on his current gig at Off the Record. Aaron, thank you very much for doing this. Really appreciate it. Hey, no problem, man. We go way back, so I'm happy to be on your show. Yeah, how long have I known you? I think you were the first person I had ever met when I, my very first class at Brock University. We're going way back to like... I'd 2001. Say, yeah, fall of 2001. So we're going on 15 years now. Yeah, because I remember 9-11 happened in like our first week on campus. I remember that happened, I think it was our first week of class, and then I think you and I had Polly Sai that day. Mm-hmm. And if I remember correctly, the professor who was doing the second semester, a lot of uh, Pierre Lizet, who was doing a lot of international political economy, he basically stood on stage, and part of his introduction was, I'm going to be rewriting the second half of this course based on what happens in the coming weeks. That was a crazy time. Yeah, it was wild. I felt like it wasn't mentioned much in that class, though. I was expecting our first poli class to be about the implications of that and what had happened. And I remember it was just kind of a blip on the radar at the beginning because nobody really had known what was going on at that point in time. Yeah, they just jumped right into it with the theory. It took a while for that to pick up. But uh, let's go even further back to the beginning. Uh, Aaron, where are you from? Um, I'm from Toronto, I was raised in Thornhill, which is about, you know, 35 minutes north of downtown. And um, I love the city, and it's really cool to still live here because I think that Toronto is an underrated city when it comes to uh, major cities in the world. I've, you know, I've been to a lot of different cities, and I think Toronto stands up to just about any of them. I'd agree with that. Uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, life growing up in Thornhill. What were your interests? Um, so when I was growing up, I loved radio and media, um, which is Obviously not a surprise that I'm in media now, but uh, I listened to a ton of radio growing up. I particularly listened to a lot of Jesse and Gene on AM640. Oh, God, um, we're going morning. way back. Yeah, I listened. To, I loved Jesse and Gene, and I used to love listening to just pop hits on radio back when I was in elementary school. Was that back in the... Was Tarzan Dan on that? Tarzan Dan yeah, on AM640. AM640, yep. Yeah, and there was a weekend uh, DJ named Mo McCall, and I used to call into her show on Saturday mornings, and she would always put me on the air requesting songs. I'd always request whatever the big hits were, and... You know, they did the thing where it was like, oh, what do you want us to play? And you'd kind of give your answer. And I w- I'd always call and try to win contests um, through the radio station. And I won a lot of them. I-, I used to win a lot of contests through AM640. Did they finally stop you and go, it looks fixed? People are like, oh, Aaron won again. Once a month, Aaron keeps winning. Was there some sort of band that said you can't do it again for X number of weeks or days? Surprisingly, they didn't have the thing where you could only win a prize every 60 days. A lot of radio stations have that now because there are people that just sit by their phone and call and try to win contests. What's well, crazy to think, too, about uh, requesting songs on the radio. Sometimes that was the only way to listen to the song. If you didn't have the money for the cassette, if I can say that, or the CD was, God, maybe they'll play it again. Now we're spoiled. You can basically play the same song on repeat all day if you want to. And you'd have a cassette that you would record the radio, too. Like, you'd hear your song. They'd be like, coming up in the next hour, you'll hear the new song from Stone Temple Pilots. And you'd hit record because you'd want to get that song. You're asking me if I was pirating that song, then. <laughs> No, that's just what people used to do I know, back I know. then. I'm just having fun. And then you'd too. make mixtapes. You'd, you'd take one ta- tape with those songs, and then you'd mix and match with other songs you taped on the radio and put them on another tape to make your master mix. The master mix with the, the dual cassette deck. Yeah, I had, I had a dual cassette deck. And I had the two-line phone so I could win contests more easily because I, I wouldn't have to wait the three seconds from when you hit hang up. I'd just go from <laughs> line to line. That's how I was so good at winning contests. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, uh, tell us a little bit more about your childhood. You mentioned you credit your parents as being a really big influence in you. Yeah, my parents were both entrepreneurs. My mom ran a store called Bronson's China, which was a China store across from Centerpoint Mall at Young and Steels, which is the uh, the intersection that has the most accidents in Canada, if I'm not mistaken, or at least at one point in time it was. <laughs> but um, she used to have a China store right at that intersection, and uh, she ran that up until I was in high school. And my dad started a business called Dent Doctor. He was the, He's the guy who would fix 
dents in cars. Like the, he did paintless dent removal. Was that the mobile one where he would come to your car? He would go to you. Yeah, You'd it was a mobile service. And then eventually he ended up opening his own shop where people could come to him and he'd have certain hours there and certain hours where he was portable and he had franchisees eventually. So he grew that business a lot. Um, and eventually kind of merged with, there was a dent doctor in, in the U.S. that he eventually kind of merged with and eventually sold his business. So my parents were both really hard workers. So I, I you know, watching them work really hard was a, a massive influence on me because I saw that it, it didn't come easy. Um, my mom worked long hours and, uh, you know, I'd get to go to her store all the time and just see how it operated. And, you know, I really admired her work ethic and my dad's work ethic. I mean, my dad was, uh, you know, dirty hands every day, you know, get, getting um, getting down on, on his knees to make sure he could fix the dents. And, you know, watching them work so hard was just a massive influence on me. And tell us a little bit about your grandfather, because you uh, cite him as being an influence, too. Yeah, my grandfather was a Holocaust survivor. So he was in Auschwitz and uh, in various concentration camps. And, uh, you know, his family was uh, was taken in by the Nazis from Hungary. He was, um, at the time, had been sent to something called a yeshiva, which is like kind of um, for Jewish education and things like that. So he had left his family. And his family had been rounded up by the Nazis, and he was rounded up by the Nazis subsequently. And uh, his whole family, aside from two sisters, were wiped out in the war oh, uh, by the Nazis in the con- yeah in the concentration camps. And um, once once he survived, two of his sisters survived, and one of them died of polio shortly after the war. So he eventually ended up meeting his uh, one of his younger sisters who survived the war, um, and she still is alive in Israel today. My grandfather, unfortunately, has passed in the last couple of years, um, but. He also worked really hard. He was a taxi driver. He worked in a in a clothing factory. You know, he took whatever job he could get to support his family. He had four daughters, um, and they lived in a really tiny house in North York, and eventually he was able to buy a, a bigger house, and he was really into investing. Um, you know, unfortunately, he was one of these kind of cooler types where he'd buy a stock and it would just plummet. But oh, he, no. he he did really well with all of his other investments. So, he you know, he would buy houses to rent out. Um, he was very kind of crafty and creative with, with ways that he could make money on top of working just a regular job. Um, so he did really well in that, in that, uh, facet. But to me, the most influential part about him was, you know, knowing what he went through and, um, you know, what he had to live with his whole life, um, with his, you know, most of his family being wiped out, his parents being killed. Um, you know, knowing what he had went through, I never thought that anything was hard. You know, if I was ever... You know, thinking that something was, oh, man, you know, this is really hard and, and really difficult. I would always think, well, you know, what he had to go through, you, you know, put put, put if, myself if in can, that spot. No, I see what you're saying. If he can still smile about life, even though looking back at his past, there isn't really a lot to smile about. Whatever bad day you're having isn't really that bad of a day when it stacks up. Yeah, and he was honestly the most upbeat and and happy man that I have ever known. He, you know, never had a bad word to say about anybody. He was never bitter, you know. And, I mean, he struggled, obviously, with mental health throughout the years. I think he probably had some post-traumatic stress. Oh, who wouldn't have? Yeah, and things of that nature. But he never really showed it. And, uh, you know, he was just a a real family man, and family was always first with him. Uh, So, you know, growing up and and seeing him and what he went through was always just a massive influence for me because, um, you know, he was my hero. With him getting through what he had gone through and then um, putting together the life that he had put together, you know, without an extended family, just coming from nothing. After the war, he moved to Rochester, New York, and met my grandmother and moved to Toronto. Um, just seeing what he went through was just a massive influence on me. Wow. Uh, so when did you decide that you wanted to be in the media or your passion kind of went that way? I was kind of torn because my, my mom always kind of pushed me towards the business side of things. and I, I had an interest in business and marketing and entrepreneurship, um, but I also always had an interest in media. And when I was a kid, I go back to calling uh, Mo McCall on the weekends because – one day she said, how about you and your friends come down for a tour of the radio station? And to me, that was the greatest thing ever. That's crazy. Yeah. You know, well, I, I had always romanticized what the radio station would be like. And to get to go and see all the different studios and watch people do their shows and even s- sit in a studio like the one we're sitting in right now where, we, you know, it's just like, like a little post-production studio. That, to me, was the coolest thing. And I had a couple friends from elementary school come with me. And I don't know how interested they were, but, you know, if you're a kid, everything is cool. Everything is way cooler when you're a kid than it is when you're a jaded adult. Well, so, you're staring at that microphone in the booth, and you're going, that microphone is going to reach thousands and thousands of people. That's what people talk to you about. That's how you come out on the other side of their speakers or their stereos for the most part. 
Yeah, and I thought that was unbelievable. So when I did that, you know, really, I wanted to be a DJ like the ones on that station. I wanted to be like, you know, you're coming up in the next hour. We've got some uh, hollow notes, and we've got some uh, – <laughs> the pretenders will be, uh, you know, coming up. And if you're the sixth caller through right now, you'll win tickets to the Toronto Maple Leafs game. That, that's always what I wanted to do. But uh, eventually I saw the industry change, you know, uh, yeah, with, with Clear Channel in the U.S., um, and all the shows going into syndication, it didn't seem like a viable living. And, you know, I listen to Howard Stern a lot, and Howard Stern is very uh, jaded on the industry and how much it changed. And I saw how much he had to struggle to get to where he was and all the BS that he had to put up with. And, uh, you know, I, I've kind of realized that eventually it wasn't for me. I still have a strong passion for music. Um, you know, when we were at Brock together, I was the music director at CFBU, yep. which was the campus radio station. And I saw the red tape just being on the board of directors there. That, that we had to go through with the student union and even internal squabbles. And I realized that, you know, that wasn't the life that I wanted. And, um, you know, I did broadcasting in university as well, um, which I think we'll get into a little bit later on. But just I, I, I realized that media was where I wanted to go. I, I really wanted to be, um, you know, either on the air or behind the scenes in media and just be in this world in some facet. Well, and that's where we got to know each other because we were both in the communications uh, program at Brock University. But you jumped right into the hands, uh, got into the hands-on experience right from the uh, start. Uh, tell us about your time at the Brock Press. Yeah, you know, it was orientation day, my first week at university, and my goal was to seek out any different media um, that was available on campus. So I went to the Brock Press, and I wanted to volunteer there right away. I went to CFBU, which was the radio station at Brock, still exists today, um, and I wanted to volunteer there. And I, you know, I, I just wanted to jump in with both feet. To me, you know, I wasn't a good student in high school. Maybe that's why I ended up at Brock. But, um, and, and I love Brock University, and it's really expanded a lot. But at the time, Brock was an easy university to get into. Now, not so much. Now it's really um, up this profile. And, and the, the campus, I haven't been there in like 10 years. I've heard it's dramatically different. I was there a couple of years ago. There's like four or five buildings that weren't there yeah. when we were there. And Brock is an awesome university. So, I'm, you know, I'm not trying to slag Brock. But um, Brock also at the time had the, the best communications program in Ontario. And that's that's why I wanted to go there, you know. Communications is what I wanted to get into, and I kind of had a, a misconception of what communications was. I thought communications was about you know getting into media and all of that, and it is to an extent. You you learn a lot about media and media policy. Um, but there's a lot of that Marshall McLuhan theory stuff applied to yes. it as well. Yes, so communications theory as a whole, and that stuff I wasn't ready for, but I really enjoyed learning about it. I thought it was really cool. And then there was the business end of things because I took business communications, so I did a lot of uh, of different business courses, but. You know, at Brock, I really just wanted to get my feet wet and, and do as much as I could. I really wanted to get involved on campus with as much as I possibly could because w with high school, I kind of coasted. With university, I thought of it as, as a second opportunity for me to reinvent myself and, and really, you know, my parents paid for my university. I was very lucky. I didn't have to carry any student loans. And I felt like I really owed it to them to not screw around on campus and not um, do anything that would... Um, you know, that would be a wasted investment for them. But I, thought, I thought that they were investing in me, and that was important to me. I really wanted to make them proud. So, so when I went to university, I wasn't all about partying. And, you know, I, I, I went out and, you know, I, I you got partied. to. I was yeah, right there with you. Yeah, but I wasn't, I wasn't someone who jeopardized my education. I wasn't someone who That's true. was willing to make my education come second to the university experience. But to me, the university experience wasn't about going out and partying um, exclusively. It was about becoming involved in camp on campus and and doing as much as I could. I you know I ran for student union office and I ran, you know I, I wrote for the paper and I I did work with CFBU um, and I got jobs out of it too. That so that helped me make money while I was at university as well. And I got to make money doing what I loved. I would have done it for free. So um, that was just an extra bonus. And um, you know I saw recently that the campus radio station at York shut down overnight, basically like no warning. They said, okay, we're shutting it down, we're changing the format, and it's now it's like a hip-hop channel. Um, it's just, I don't even know if it's run on campus anymore. And I was like, I thought it was crazy that they were able to just kind of railroad all the students. But to me, the, the worst part about it is students won't have the opportunity to volunteer at that station and get their feet wet and learn about how media works, what it's like to be on air. Um, and to me, that's part of the university experience, and that's not there anymore. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your time at the Brock Press. You wrote for Marginalia. Tell everyone what Marginalia was. Yeah, Marginalia was the weekly humor page. It was a full page dedicated to, like, comedy. And um, I loved that because I got to just be creative. <laughs> you know, I was basically given the keys to the car 
and uh, was told to go. So, you know, I did that, um, and I just loved coming up with different ideas of, of what I could do every week. And a lot of it, it was just I was sitting in lectures, and I'd have my notepad with me, and I'd just kind of jot down things. But is that a difficult thing to write for? Because comedy is one of those things where people really viciously judge. You never hear anyone say, oh, that movie was too scary in a negative context. But they'll say, well, that wasn't funny enough. Did you kind of find that you had to keep your guard up while you were writing that? It's actually the opposite because I approached it with a, like the attitude that if I found it funny and a couple of people found it funny, even if it was 10 people. That was funny. good enough for you? That was good enough for me. And I, you know, I didn't get a lot of criticism at all for that because I'm not sure how active you know, the audience was for the broadcast. You know, we didn't get a ton of letters about the the humor uh, page. But to me, the challenge was, you know, if you're a writer for a newspaper, let's say you're a business writer, you can kind of chase stories and you have your beat and you can follow that. With humor writing, it was just like a blank canvas every week where I would have to come up with something. And the cool part about that is it was like, well, we're, we can't not publish the page. So I had to have something. And I think that that stayed with me throughout my career. You know, to me, I, I never take no for an answer when it comes to things. You know, I there has to be something at the end of the day. I can't rest on my laurels, and that falls into under what my job is now. You know, the show must go on. And I think I learned a lot of that from writing for Marginalia and having to come up with a humor column every week. Yeah, you had a deadline. I had a deadline. You had to put it up. And I couldn't rely on anybody but myself. Uh, you mentioned earlier on that uh, Brock paved the way to a number of different jobs for you in the media. Let's talk a little bit about uh, your gig with Kojiko. Yeah, Kojiko, that's a fun one because um, I, I'm a ma- I was always a massive sports fan, especially basketball. So when I was there with the Brock, when I was with the Brock Press, I would cover some basketball games. Um, you know, I would also write sports stories and I write art stories and things like that on top of doing the humor page. So. You know, I was assigned to the Brock game, and I would go, and I'd write, and I'd interview some of the players and the coaches. And it was kind of daunting at the time as someone in university. Like, I I didn't have the same confidence I have now to just approach people and ask questions. Um, But I was sitting there front row one day um, on press row, and the play-by-play guy for for the Brock women's basketball team didn't show up that day. He just didn't show up? Didn't I don't know what happened. I don't know if it was winter and they got stuck in traffic, because some of them would commute from Toronto. Okay. So... The guy from Kojiko went up to the person who was the sports information officer for Brock. His name, was, I think his name was Sean Whitehead. And um, he said, Sean, can you call this game? And Sean was like, well, I got, I got to do um, my stuff here. Because he, he was also the um, arena announcer. So he'd be like, you know, checking into the game, number five. Throwing um, T-shirts into the audience, and, yeah, things like exactly. that. He had to handle all of that. Because, you know, the budgets for these athletic departments at Canadian universities aren't massive. So I said, I'll do it. And he goes, okay, you know all the players? I said, yeah, I'm writing about the team. I've always wanted to do this, so I'd love to try it. And he goes, okay, go ahead. And from there, I was like their guy. I, I took over doing play-by-play for basketball. <laughs> the other I guess guy, the guy didn't sh- want to come, come in from <laughs> Toronto anymore. Well, did they fire him? And Did he just I, never I show know. up again? It, it wasn't a paid gig. It was community <laughs> TV. So I did it for free, and I loved it. I, every week I would call. I was living on like right near the campus. So I would just drive in, and I would call all the basketball games. And sometimes I'd call the men's basketball games if the – a guy who did play-by-play couldn't show up because he was coming in from Toronto also. I think he worked at Sportsnet at the time. And um, sometimes he'd say, okay, we need you to do the women's and men's games. And I was on cloud nine. This was what I wanted to do at the time. I, I remember that. And you even play. did that after graduation, didn't you, as well? You yeah, came I would back come back from Toronto. I would come back from Toronto um, and drive and um, and do it. And I still would have continued with it probably if it wasn't for how quickly I got a, a full-time job out of university. Well, out of college, I guess. Um, and I did it at, uh, at Humber as well. Nice segue. Tell us about your time. Uh, at, what did you study at Humber? Uh, journalism. I, I did postgraduate journalism um, after I did Brock. Because, you know, for me, I had to make the decision to, about whether or not I wanted to um, go into marketing or I wanted to go into journalism. So after I finished at Brock, um, I did an internship in the summer c- at Cossette Communications in their creative department. Okay, yeah. Um, which is like, you know, the current day Mad Men. Um, a, l- a lot of people listening to this are very familiar with Cossette. Yeah, so I, I did an internship at, Cos- at Cossette. Um, you know, my mom works for Radke Films now. She's the CFO at Radke Films, and she had a connection at, at Cossette. And um, she said, you know, can my son have an internship there? Um, because, you know, I wanted to see if this was something I wanted to do. Because um, I was kind of torn. You know, for postgrad, I applied for journalism and I applied for copywriting at Humber South. So, okay. So, um, and I got into all the programs. So um, I went to Cossette Communications and I, I did an internship there in creative and I was just bored to tears. You know, and I saw a lot of the people that were doing 
ad writing there and copywriting. You know, they the copywriters, you know, it's a little bit romanticized because especially when you see a show like Mad Men, at the time Mad Men didn't exist, but you get to think, oh, I can come up with these awesome commercials. But what, what people neglect to tell you is you have to deal with the client side. So you can come up with the greatest commercial ever. Someone on the client side could be like, nah, you know what? I just want someone walking to their car and driving it down the highway, and, and we, we just list the safety features. And you're like, well, yeah, but I have this awesome ad idea. And they'd be like, nah, that's, that's not going to work for us. Sorry. That's I've not been what, in some of those meetings wants. before. I, I know and, you. And I, I, just, I just didn't want that. Like, I, I didn't want to have any job that would stifle my creativity. So I decided to do journalism, um, and I went to Humber. And I love Humber College. I had a great time there. I thought that they, the, the big difference between doing post secondary education at a, co- at a sorry, uh, post grad education at a college versus going to a university is basically night and day. Like, university is all theory, and you kind of have to create your own opportunities to do any sort of extracurricular stuff with, uh, with the media. Here it was completely different. It was like, okay, you're going to host news updates at this time on the radio station. You're going to go and you're going to cover this event downtown for the, the newspaper. You're going to write a column for this magazine. Um, you're going to write a long form piece for this magazine. This is going to be your assignment. You've got to do some on camera work here. They, you know, it was like they throw you right into the fire. It sounds like if you're not very passionate about it right out the door, you fall off pretty quickly from the program. 100%. I, you know, I could tell from um, when I was there who was going to be in journalism afterwards and who wasn't. You could tell within the first couple of weeks. And we had this great uh, professor named, named Ken Becker, who unfortunately was let go from the program a couple of years ago which I, I don't really understand. And he was like this corporal. Like, he was like, no, fix this. This sucks. He, you know, he would rip up people's work. He'd rip it to shreds. I think he made a, a grown man cry in the class um, that I was in. Which, and that it's guy, not that funny, guy, but... That guy was out of the program within weeks. And that's fine. And, like, I, I think that that is, is fair game. Like, if, if you're going to be... You, you want to be realistic with people if they're going to be doing journalism. Because you don't want them to... to Embarrass themselves. Yeah, you don't want them to submit bad work. You know, you want them to succeed, and some people won't succeed, and some people will. So, and the crazy thing too, not to cut you off there, unlike say, for example, a university where maybe lawyers or businessmen will eventually become the figureheads of companies, and it will get connected back to them. You're in Bronstetter from Humber. You're on air. You're literally representing Humber and that program right there more than anything else. So that program lives or dies with you. They don't want any phonies out there. Yeah, and they want people to get jobs also. I mean, that's that's the. The, the big thing for them is they want good people to get good jobs. And they, they do a great job of setting people up for success in that regard. And with Ken, the, the ultimate compliment for me was, um, you know, I was doing my first year there. And he does this thing where it's like you go, they have an arboretum at Humber, like a kind of a park area with okay. water and flowers. And We're talking about the North Campus, right? North Campus, yeah, okay. in Rexdale. So he he says, okay, we're going to walk to the arboretum. He's like a car just drove into, into, this, uh, into this river. I'm the police officer. You know, what are, what are some questions you have? And I, you know, I asked a couple questions. I then proceeded to take off my shoes and socks, roll up my pants, and walk into the water and start taking pictures with an invisible camera that I, that I had with my hands. And he goes, what are you doing? And I go, I'm taking pictures. I, you know, I want to get the best possible pictures for this article. And he gave me this cockeyed look. And the next year, apparently, they, he did the same assignment. And he said to the students, why aren't any of you rolling up your pants and getting into the water to take pictures? <laughs> and this guy was like the most critical professor. When I heard that story, I was like, I was as happy as could be. Like, I was happy as a clam that I had made a, an impact on this guy who had like the highest possible standards with journalism. He had to rethink his standards because of you. Yeah. So that, that's the story I always tell about, about him at Humber. But, you know, Humber, to me, put me in such a great position to succeed. And I, I was so gung-ho about getting into the into the the industry um and i just worked my tail off and you know there was another story where we were given an assignment it was the um the election um i think it was the provincial election and we were put into a team of four people and um or or maybe it was three people and each of us were assigned doing an interview with the candidate in our riding it was like three people had lived in the same riding so i was given the liberal candidate who was the incumbent another person was given the um, conservative, um, the conservative uh, candidate, another person would give the NDP candidate. So it was the day that we had to hand this in, and one person in my group goes, I wasn't able to get an interview with the candidate. And I go, what do you mean you weren't able to get an interview with the candidate? Um, she goes, well, he, they, they wouldn't return my calls. And I was like, well, that's, I was like, okay. I went online, I found a bunch of numbers from the, that office, and I called and I said, I need to speak to this, like, I need to speak to this MP, this uh, candidate right away, the conservative candidate. 
And they go, well, what's it regarding? I go, I'm writing a piece about them for the newspaper. You know, you guys have been dodging my calls, and I'm going to write the article one way or another. So, Oh, nice. Yeah, so it would be better if I could speak to them. You know, I'm not looking to paint them in a negative light. And they were like, okay. I said, I'm, you know, I'm writing for the Humber, for Humber, whatever the Humber newspaper was called. And I got him on the phone within 10 minutes and did the interview. Nice. And, uh, you know, I didn't have to say anything to that person. I did, we handed it in. But to me, like, that was just my attitude. I was like, I was not going to fail. You, you know, by any means necessary, we had to get that interview. Do you spend one or two years at Humber? Um, I spent a year and a half at Humber. Um, and the reason why it was a year and a half is because uh, midway through my second year, I got hired full time um, at the score. Oh, nice. So I basically went to my professor, my, uh, professor and said, you know, I've been offered a full time job here. And I'd like to accept it. Um, I don't know if I'm going to get a diploma or not, but I'm going to have to leave the program. You can't. Yeah. You can't walk away from. And that. they were thrilled that I got the offer. And they oh, that's said, good. They basically said, you know, um, keep us posted on what you're doing. Write us some papers about your experience on the job, and we'll give you we'll give you your postgrad diploma. This is the best bit of press Humber's journalism program could ever get. Because not only did it work for you, you got your job halfway through, and then they wanted you to continue in the program, and they worked around your schedule to make sure you graduated. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, um, I, I loved I loved the experience at Humber. Um, and, I, I, again, I got that full-time job, and they were thrilled for me. You know, they weren't trying to stifle it by any means. They And getting a full-time job while you're still in, in college is, is hard to do. And I think they understood the, the magnitude of that. So tell us a little bit about your time at the score. I spent a little bit of time there myself uh, as an intern working in the media library years ago. And, and I tell anyone that will listen that the score back, we're going back to 2005, 2004, mm-hmm. was one of the most magical places out there. Uh, how did you feel about it? <laughs> the score was awesome because it was a bunch of people that just loved sports, throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what stuck. Um you know, and it's launched the careers of so many awesome broadcasters. That's I mean, true. You look at Adnan Virch on ESPN now and doing so much that he's hosting Baseball Tonight, occasionally hosts Mike and Mike. He's just a, he's his this, his ascent in the broadcasting industry is unbelievable. He's an uh, an incredible talent. Elliot Friedman now is with Sportsnet. Tim and Sid just got their own show at Sportsnet. And they were they were uh, at the score. Cabby was at the score and Cabby's here at TSN now. Martin Gaird. Yep. yep. Yeah, she got her start at the score. I mean, there's. There, I'm sure I'm forgetting a ton of of heavy hitters that were at the score. But James Bomani, Bomani Jones example, had a yep. radio show. But Monty Jones is one of the biggest personalities at ESPN now. James Sabalski, like you mentioned, there's so many great personalities that have come out of the score. Um, and John Levy was as good a boss as you'll be able to have. Um, he, he's the he's the person that owned the score. Mm-hmm. Um, such a great, approachable guy, and such a creative mind, and willing to take risks. And it was just an environment that bred. Such great talent and, and such such go getters. Um, somebody could write a book on the crazy stories of things that happened at the score. My score story uh, that I tell people was it was the day the Leafs had signed Eric Lindros. We knew he, that he was going to be signed. We were waiting for the press conference. But you know how it is; you can only speculate. You can't make it official. And uh, I forgot who it was again. I think it was Steve Coolius. He said to me, he "Goes look, we need twenty shots of Eric Lindros." 10 shots of him making great plays and 10 shots of him getting knocked on his head because we're going to be doing a debate as to whether or not this is an asset or a liability for the Leafs. And I remember when they actually announced that he had been signed, all of a sudden someone said he signed and everyone just scattered to their desks to start Mm -hmm. writing or doing everything. Like I've never, I've been in the media industry since 2006, I want to say 2005, if you count that, I've never seen any more magic than I have than when I worked there. Yeah, it's it's pretty crazy. It's like that here at TSN also. When when news happens, we are like everybody is like on top of it immediately. And it's crazy how hard working people are here. Like TSN is just that's the big the biggest difference. You guys I, got five channels now. Yeah, but that's the biggest difference between TSN and the score that I saw was that just the organization. It's just like everyone here is so organized and the structure is is so um is so unbelievable. Like, everybody knows exactly what they need to do at any given time. And, like, the margin of error here is so low because of how diligent everybody is here. And, um, you know, at the score, I think it was hard because I, I don't think that that the that it was as organized. I think that a lot of people were kind of flying by the seat of their pants um, a lot of the time. Well, yeah. some of the shelves I used to uh, source beta tapes from were out in the hallway. Yeah. The media uh, yeah library. I would be like, that. I'd have to go out there and get a beta tape. I'd be like, really? Yeah. You just have this lying around there? And it ran out of a hotel. Yeah, it was. It was yeah, at the, it was at the uh, Hyatt now. Yeah, the, the top two or the bottom two floors of the Hyatt. 
No, third and fourth. Third oh, and no, fourth no. Floor. When I was there, they didn't even have that. They just had one floor. Yeah, they had one, one floor. studio. The fourth floor opened up when I was there. Okay, yeah, because they, they hadn't even painted the black on the outside. Mm-hmm. They didn't have that window. It was just white all around. You couldn't even tell the score was there yeah. unless you went to the lobby. Uh, but tell us a little bit more about your time at the score, what you did there. Well, at the score, the way I got into the score was I was an intern at the Fan 590. And um, a, a guy named Mike Gentelli, who was producing uh, primetime sports for with, you know, with Bob McCowan, um, he, um, you know, he was working on that day's show. And I was, I had only been there maybe a week or two at this point, maybe, maybe a little longer, maybe a month. Um, and I walked up to him and said, Hey, this great story just broke about, um, Roger Maris. His family is saying that anybody who breaks the 61 home run record that he set, uh, they're not going to consider the real record holder because of the, this is the steroid era in baseball. Okay. And he goes, Can you, uh, oh, do you think you can get someone from, uh, the Maris family on the phone? I said, Yeah, yeah, I can. And I said, It just, I had no idea. I don't, didn't have any contacts. I had zero contacts at that point in time. I went on the internet and I found Randy Maris's number within like three minutes, called him, he was booked. And uh, Mike was like, wow, thank you. I said, I said, Mike, what time do you want him? And he was like, okay, whatever, 4.15 or whatever it was. And, um, you know, I think later that week, I, you know, Mike pulled me aside and said, hey, what do you want to do in this industry? I was walking with him to Tim Hortons on the campus. And I said, well, you know, I, I have a real knack for, for chasing guests and, and I really am I'm interested in it. I got a real rush out of it. Um, and I, I really want to just be a really good producer in this business. I, you know, I like working behind the scenes. I've done some on-air stuff, um, but I, I get more enjoyment out of working behind the scenes and, and elevating products. And he said, well, that's, that's really refreshing because everybody who comes in here as an intern wants to be on-air. None of them want to be producers. And I said, well, you know, I think I could be on-air, you know, I, but it's not really I – don't, I don't think I have as much passion as a lot of other people do. To me, it's not the be-all, end-all. I just want to be in this industry, and I want to make a difference. And uh, that was refreshing to him. And um, about a month later, uh, he got hired as the senior producer for Hardcore Sports Radio, which was the satellite radio channel that the score was launching. So um, he said to me at at some point, he said, I'm going to try to get you hired there. I think you'd be a really good producer. And he was willing to take a chance on me. Again, I had zero contacts at this time. I hadn't produced a single radio show. Um, and, And with what you do... You need a pretty strong Rolodex, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. And he wanted to he wanted to bring me on board, um, even though there were producers, there were interns that had been there for like two years. There were lots of part time producers. He saw something in me, and um, I'll forever be, be thankful to Mike. But, you know, Mike gave me my big break, and to Richard Garner, who was running the station, who also gave me a chance. You know, they brought me in for an interview, and I and they said, "What are your contacts like?" And I said, "I don't have it. I don't have any, but I can find you a contact in five minutes." Like I'm I'm the type of guy that will go online, and I you know I'm resourceful. And they trusted me. and um, They, they didn't know, try to put you in, uh, to a test, be like, find this athlete's number, go, or a family member? Well, That's your audition? Um, I, I can't remember if they did or not. Um, but, you know, I had, I had about a month of prep before our first show started. You know, I got to meet the host, and the host, you know, I came up with a list of guys that the host wanted on the show within, like, the first month. And I was starting to book them like it. You know, I was booking them left and right, and I, 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 got, I got into a groove, and I had this notebook. I still have it. It just has all these numbers in it, like numbers to people that would help me get that number. Um, and I just I had a real knack for it, and I, I love it. I still love it to this day. I love chasing guests. It's, it's my absolute passion. Um, so, you know, at the score, the station started out, and at first it was just like two shows, three shows. It was the drive show. The, the show that I was producing, which was the late night show called Sports Rage with Gabriel Morenci. And there was the weekend show, which was a fantasy football show on Sunday, on Football Sunday. And that's all the station had at that point in time. Um, so on our very first show, my, my first guest that I had booked was Gilbert Arenas, who was like an NBA all-star at the time. And I had him booked at 1130 that night, Eastern time. So he when that when that phone rang that I didn't have his number I had to rely on him calling in oh boy when that phone rang at 11:30 I was on cloud 9 it was like a heavenly feeling and um I still remember that like if if people ask me what my most memorable guest I've booked is that that's the one right there and not because it's even close to the biggest name I've booked but because that the feeling that I got when that phone rang for the first time can never ever be duplicated We're going to stop right there, but come back next week, Monday, July 27th, where Aaron is going to dive into detail about his role on TSN's Off the Record. As always, you can catch up on past episodes at soundcloud.com slash mediapeoplepodcast and follow me on Twitter at Vic Genova.